welcome uh, everyone uh, good afternoon and uh, i guess uh, uh, you know we we are our own session chairs today so we'll just introduce ourselves uh, as we go along and um, so uh, i'm coming from the web science lab uh, most of you uh, have seen the guru labs uh, in the front uh, thing so that's where our lab is okay. so uh, our work um, uh, our research is primarily about understanding the world wide web as in, you know the, the entire focus of the lab or our research is somehow related to the world wide web some elements of the world wide web and uh, uh, more importantly the thing is uh, we are not working in technologies for the world wide web rather we are looking at what we call web science that is what is the web you know trying to understand the web so we are not really looking at say web development frameworks or uh, uh, http standards or you know th th those kinds of uh, uh, or protocols and so on but uh, we are trying to understand the interplay between um, world wide web and social problems okay uh, you know uh, the impact of the web on uh, you know education on uh, uh, you know governance on uh, different kinds of other uh, such problems okay? uh, just to give a background uh, i um, why uh, we started this lab um, uh, i kind of uh, came from a traditional database uh, research background in fact uh, i started my research here um, uh, on by developing this concept of graph databases so we were one of the first to develop this concept of uh, graph databases back in 2002 and uh, we kind of uh, had good uh, successes so we even uh, had a nice little uh, commercial product called anmol uh, in uh, collaboration with a company but uh, uh, due to various reasons uh, because of some ip related issues we could not take that forward and uh, so we uh, we had to give away all our uh, 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 you know code and everything that we had um, worked over here uh, so at that time uh, i was um, uh, i had to find a new research topic and uh, uh, so what um, uh, then i focused my um, uh, attention towards the web right and uh, so at that time we were also pretty small a pretty young institute triple uh, itb as such uh, at the time was um, we 6 7 years old um, and uh, one of the arguments that i used to make you know in the 1990s at least the conventional wisdom was that uh, uh, if you had to do research in computer science or it or anything related to it you have to go to the us no questions asked kind of okay so i was kind of a contrarian to that uh, argument and uh, the basic uh, element of my argument is that the world wide web is a game changer okay the world wide web is going to deeply impact the world as we know uh, as we know it and uh, all conventional wisdom is going to get challenged and uh, uh, you know uh, the source of innovation the source of uh, uh, social progress is no longer going to be from the so called first world and so on it is going to change okay uh, i don't um, well it's partly true after all these years i know that uh, uh, yeah it, it is quite a bit of a, a change so uh, and uh, this this gave me the impetus to come back and look at these questions that uh, have been uh, that have been uh, uh, entertaining in my head for several years uh, by the time right and um, so let me start off um, about um, the world wide web like this so broadly the talk uh, <coughs> you know i'll i'll broadly talk for about half an hour or so and uh, uh, where uh, you know i am the big picture guy so i'll just give the big picture uh, and uh, uh, more details of specific work will be taken up by two of our uh, research scholars uh, uh, after uh, this talk okay so let me try and give the big picture in terms of uh what is the perspective towards which we are uh, looking at the web right and um, so if you see th these are some uh, recent news topics that um, that have come up uh, this, some of them are already old 66a and so on uh, but um, you know gdpr privacy uh, net neutrality uh, you know and there there are even new terms in our vocabulary these days uh, trolling cyber bullying some blue whale all all kinds of uh, stuff right and um, in fact if you see uh i uh, it won't be wrong to say that many of these vocabulary terms are like for example uh, trolling right is a 21st century term right it it did not exist in the 20th century right so uh, in the 21st century several new terms have entered our mainstream vocabulary right and uh, 
uh, e-banking, mobile wallets, all kinds of phishing, right, and, uh, and so on. Okay. So clearly there is a difference. There's, there's a clear difference from the 20th century to the 21st century. And, and the only thing that, that has changed is the World Wide Web. Or the, is the emergence of the World Wide Web, right, and uh, over the uh, across the entire uh, uh, world as a whole. Okay, and of course, uh, uh, if uh, uh, you know people from my generation would uh, uh, recognize that uh, in the 1990s we used to have lots of these terms like uh, uh, there's a global information superhighway and uh, the world is getting smaller. We are becoming a global village and uh, uh, national boundaries are uh, uh, becoming irrelevant. We are all world citizens. All kinds of stuff, right? And uh, uh, do you know when was the last time such terms were heard in um, in uh, national discourse? This was not the first time people were talking about the world is getting smaller, the national boundaries are uh, breaking down, barriers are breaking down, a new era for world peace, and so on, right? And uh, any idea when uh, when was the last time people talked like that? It was when airplanes were invented. This was not uh, so when when airplanes were invented, same thing uh, you know at the turn of the 20th century. Okay, we uh, uh, we could see very similar rhetoric. Okay, that the world is getting smaller, we are becoming a global village, all our uh, walls are breaking, and you know and, and so on, right? And uh, but uh, clearly, if you see the history, the invention of the airplane directly led to World War One and World War Two. In fact, World War One and World War Two, airplanes played a very, very critical role. The, the technology of airplanes played a very critical role, right? And uh, so uh, clearly, things are not that simple, right? And we are, uh, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> yeah, of course, we are. Uh, walls are there very much today. The you know the world is still uh, getting bigger. You know, or uh, the, the, there are lots of different uh, uh, ways in which we learn how to divide ourselves and so on, right? And, so, so let's look at a quick uh, history of the World Wide Web and uh, see, uh, you know, how it progressed and it, it kind of makes, uh, helps me uh, build a case around uh, what the web is about. Right? And, uh, so the web started sometime in um, uh, 1989 uh, when uh, 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 the, a physicist at CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research, uh, so he had a problem uh, that had nothing to do with physics per se, but that had to do with um, management of huge amount of literature that was being generated around physical physics experiments, right? And um, so there were lots of papers, there were lots of technical reports and so on, which were distributed all across uh, CERN's uh, machines. And uh, there's no simple way of organizing them, right? And uh, so he came out with a proposal. Uh, at that time, it was called uh, MESH, uh, which, was, uh, which was this proposal. And this is the original paper. And, uh, uh, you know, you go to the World Wide Web conference and so on. Typically, there is a display of this paper with this comment up here. Okay, so uh, th this was the comment from, uh, from his boss, uh, which says, vague but exciting. So, okay. so uh, uh, at the time, uh, uh, you know, having a specific ordering, uh, imposing a particular order on uh, documents and so on was, was very important. But what uh, Tim Berners-Lee was suggesting was, a completely organic way in which to organize information. Okay, so primarily the um, you know the World Wide Web as he uh, or the mesh as it was suggested, which later became World Wide Web in uh, uh, 1990, uh, was uh, just a combination of two things. Okay, one there was an already known um, uh, technology called hypertext. Okay, uh, hypertext was where uh, you're reading a document and uh, uh, one part of the document can, uh, uh, you know, uh, can, has a pathway to load some other document and so on. Okay, so there were some hypertext uh, browsers at the times, uh, like Info and uh, uh, you know a few other uh, browsers like that. So hypertext technology was known. Okay, and the second one was um, TCP/IP networking, right? And uh, where uh, every document in the world was given a unique uh, address uh, by the, what was called URL at the time, right? And um, uh, now it is called IRI, uh, International Resource Identifier, and so on. Uh, so uh, just these two technology bringing together uh, made uh, all the difference, in, uh, right? And the first uh, web page uh, appears in 1990. So this was the logo of the World Wide Web when uh, 
uh, it was started. And uh, uh, in 1991, um, uh, people outside of CERN started using uh, the World Wide Web. Okay, and uh, uh, this was the time of uh, open source movements. Uh, so Unix had started uh, uh, the open sourcing. Uh, AT&T and uh, you know several other uh, companies at the time had started this. Uh, 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 process of uh, you know open sourcing all the source code and developing, uh, creating a developer ecosystem, right? And uh, so uh, this was done for the same uh, by uh, CERN. They realized the potential of World Wide Web, so they released the code on a royalty-free, permanent basis for the public, right? And uh, which uh, created a major uh, impact on on the way the web grew. And, and this, I think, is a is one of the key decisions that made the web today what it is, right? And um, <clears throat> then in 94, uh, uh, MIT invited Tim Berners-Lee to, uh, to form the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, W3C, right? And uh, right at that time, uh, they had uh, uh, come out with several uh, key principles uh, behind uh, the web, and uh, which today uh, is again um, a, a matter of uh, very high contention. Uh, if you read some of the papers today, you know, uh, some of the articles today, you see a lot of articles saying Tim Berners-Lee is a very sad person today or a depressed person, right? And uh, why? Because many of these founding principles are slowly getting eroded away, right? And uh, so one of the founding principles was decentralization, right? And um, so no one controls content on the web. You know, anybody should be able to put up a web page uh, on their own and uh, uh, connect to any other web page and so on, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, non-discrimination, what we call net neutrality, but uh, net neutrality is at a um, network level, but even at a content level, uh, you know, there should be no discrimination. Every URL is the same. There's no URL which is more equal than other URLs. All URLs are uh, equal, right? And um, uh, then bottom-up design, uh, so open source and participatory approach to this thing. And universality, which is uh, agnostic to any operating systems or platforms and so on. And finally, consensus-based approach to standards. You know, so even today, the consensus uh, uh, W3C standards bodies uh, have a very elaborate process of gathering inputs and getting, uh, uh, creating consensus and so on. Right? And uh, uh, very quickly again, uh, so 93 was when uh, the first graphical web browser uh, came out, uh, which was the Mosaic web browser from uh, NCSA, Mark Anderson uh, created that. He went on to later found um, uh, the Firefox, uh, uh, Netscape Navigator, which uh, later on became Firefox, and so, right? And um, so Mosaic Communications, he went on to found that. And, um, and uh, but then uh, until about 95 or 96, right? Uh, most of the web pages were, or most of the domain names on the internet, not just web pages, okay? The largest domain name was .edu. Right, and um, so most of the content on the internet was from universities, right? And uh, and uh, university content was primarily like a, you know technical reports or blogs or you know at, uh, we, at, at the time there was no term called blog, but basically writings, right? And uh, people didn't worry too much about security, about um, you know if somebody came and uh, uh, hacked into my computer, all they'll find is technical reports. Uh, I'll be glad if they read them at least, right? And so nobody really bothered about security. But really, that started changing with the dot-com boom, right? And uh, in the in the 96, uh, uh, 96 to 2000, and uh, and that is where the, you know, uh, there was the first major inflection point in in the way uh, we see about the web, right? And suddenly, commercial interest started getting uh, more uh, uh, serious uh, about the web, right? And uh, so there was this uh, get large or get lost. Uh, mantra, right? And uh, so there was a lot of funding, VC funding put into dot com, and uh, you had to become big. And uh, so many of these uh, early e commerce sites, so Yahoo, Excite, like us, all of them kind of uh, came uh, around this time, right? And um, and uh, uh, the the presence of um, business interest or commercial interest prompted uh, regulations to come up for the first time. Uh, around the World Wide Web, and uh, India was one of the first countries to come out with the uh, uh, IT Act, right? In uh, uh, in 2000, uh, it has been amended a couple of times be, uh, after that. And so on. <coughs> but uh, of course, uh, after uh, a few years, so Bill Clinton kind of uh, rode on this success. Uh, in fact, he was kind of uh, a large part of his uh, 
uh, you know, success came from actually the success of uh, dot com at the time. And uh, this is when uh, George W. Bush came over. Uh, and uh, around this time, you know, uh, there was a, a first meltdown that was happening, uh, coupled uh, with 9-11, uh, uh, you know, terror attacks and so on. So there was a major meltdown uh, in the uh, web uh, uh, ecosystem, right? And um, so many companies went bankrupt, Excite, like ours. Um, uh, I, I guess one of the uh, saddest stories is uh, Nortel Networks, right? Uh, so Nortel Networks um, invested a huge amount of money uh, to build uh, fiber optic cables uh, all across US and, and several other places across the world, but they could not sustain it, right? And uh, they had to go bankrupt. But if it were not for Nortel Networks and their fiber optic cables, Today's multimedia-driven uh, web, YouTube's or the uh, IMS protocols and so on, would not have really took off without this backbone. Right? Until that time, web access was through dial-up connections and so on, very low bandwidth. And, and uh, this was one which, which actually created the, the high bandwidth backbone uh, for the web. Right? And uh, sadly, they didn't uh, survive the dot-com burst around it. And around 2002, um, the web comes back with a bang, and which is uh, uh, what we now call Web 2.0, right? And um, so the major difference between uh, the uh, web earlier and Web 2.0 was, uh, uh, you know, uh, the social uh, uh, aspect of the web. Okay? So web became more and more a participatory medium rather than just a uh, medium where you could see web pages and uh, you know download web pages and so. On. Right? And, um, and around 97, 98, uh, there were also some early versions of social media, uh, so-called social media at uh, the time, right? Uh, sixdegrees.com. And uh, so th they kind of took uh, research from uh, uh, social network analysis and tried to implement that, right? And um, so six degrees uh, was uh, based on this uh, common uh, uh, folk wisdom that uh, Anybody in the world can be connected to anybody else within six degrees of separation. So, so, so they actually built a website called sixdegrees.com and so on, right? And, um, and uh, there are also uh, something called CSCW at the time, uh, Computer Supported Collaborative Work, and, uh, uh, which uh, one of the biggest uh, outcomes from CSCW research was this idea of wikis, uh, which uh, now we see wikis, uh, without wikis, uh, the biggest encyclopedia on the net uh, would not be, have been possible. Right and uh, yeah, so more and more uh, quickly. So now we get more serious, and uh, uh, so uh, wikis came onto the web. Now uh, there are there are also something called uh, MMPORGs, which were kind of uh, uh, you know uh, dial-in kind of games, online games, which which also came to the uh, web. Uh, Second Life, uh, World of Warcraft, all kinds of other. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll talk about that why why it is important and so on okay and uh, uh, social networking really came of age uh, somewhere around this time right and a launch of twitter and mainstreaming of uh, microblogging and so on 2006 and 2007 so, okay and now uh, what is happening is uh, uh, the access to the web is getting more and more uh, 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 towards the, the the edge devices are are becoming uh, th there's a wide diversity of this, right? Uh, earlier, you could access the web only through a web browser, but uh, today we use web browsers, but we use a lot of other uh, devices to, to access the web. So uh, we have smartphones, we have IoT, uh, and especially with WebSocket and so on. Uh, we, we also started uh, do, uh, you know, implementing uh, client-server and, uh, and uh, chat kind of applications on, on the web, right? <coughs> So uh, primarily what is happening today is, um, is some kind of a convergence. Uh, you know, so one, there's the World Wide Web as, uh, uh, as a primary platform okay, on which different kinds of devices are, uh, are, uh, uh, are getting enabled. Right? Uh, so there are uh, GPS devices, RFID devices, uh, IoT devices, and so on, uh, which, which come uh, enabled for the web. Okay? And, uh, more recently, the uh, more importantly, the thing is, your uh, connectivity to the web is becoming more and more implicit. It's not explicit, right? In the 1990s, right, if you had to go to the World Wide Web, you had to first uh, log in into your computer, 
right uh, uh, dial up your modem it will go king 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 you know so many times and then uh, connect and then start your web browser and then get on you know just getting onto the web was a huge device a huge uh, exercise in itself okay but today you are on the web okay whether you like it or not okay and even if you are disconnected you are still on the web okay even if your smartphone is off it is off you know some camera somewhere will be recognizing who you are right uh, uh, thanks to ai and uh, uh, machine learning and so on uh, and uh, it's already processing that is you have become a part of a component somewhere and it's already processing you right okay this guy was here and, and so on, right and uh, so uh, so this is where we are today and uh, there have been some controversial uh, experiments as well i'll talk about that in a moment uh, uh, i think the first major controversy was uh, was was the so called facebook experiment uh, uh, i don't know if you have heard of that uh, facebook experiment uh, so what facebook did was um, uh, they actually tried to uh, tried to see if we can manipulate your emotions right by changing the nature of the posts that you see on your timeline and uh, they showed that uh, there is actually evidence of large scale emotional contagion that is if i give you a lot of depressing news then you will also start posting depressing things right if i start giving you happy news you'll start posting happy thing you know there, there was a correlation with uh, with that and uh, and uh, it was very controversial because users were not told that they are part of an experiment and uh, you never know you know if somebody is uh, on the brink of committing suicide and then you give them all depressing news and uh, you, you don't know what uh, right and uh, so uh but uh, this is just the start in fact i'll show that this is way more than the facebook experiment today right and um, <coughs> so uh, in 2006 um tim bernersley and others uh, uh, so they started saying okay uh, we have built help build the web at least to this but it is now time to see what is the web doing to us right and uh, so they coined this term called web science or web science research right and um, and the first web science research initiative um, uh, uh, you know was started by MIT CSAIL and uh, University of Southampton uh, uh, and there is uh, something called the web science research institute which is uh, uh, you know which runs from the university of southampton which um, uh, uh, to this day kind of uh, is uh, devoted to studying what what the web is doing to us right R- rather than how to build the web and so on. okay uh, our own interest kind of came uh, in 2006 itself i had uh, published this book uh, this was called the power law of information and um, uh, the subtitle is called life in a connected world right and um, so uh, this was uh, the first culmination of all that i had been thinking myself over the last 10 years or so and how the web is uh, affecting uh, our lives and how it is changing the world and so on uh and uh, uh, so quite by coincidence around the same time we had uh, ourselves looked at uh, started looking at um, uh, the world wide web uh, and understanding the impact of the world wide web so we had started a course on web information retrieval the, a course on network science for the web uh, and so on and uh, uh, you know i kind of learned by chance uh, that there's this thing called web science uh, research that was happening so uh, when we bid for the world wide web conference uh so some of us had bid for the conference in 2005 uh then finally the conference came to india in 2011 right uh, tim bernersley was here and several others were uh. so uh, that was when we said okay let's also formally name our lab itself as, as web science lab and uh, work towards uh, you know uh, fo- shift our focus f- uh, fully on this okay so um, so let me try and um, uh change gears a little bit and try to understand now what is the web really right and um, so uh, we have been uh, uh, trying to build models of um, you know what the web is actually and uh, over several decades and uh, and we'll see how our understanding of the web has been changing right and uh, if you note uh, that nothing like the web has ever been recorded in human history right so uh, and we don't see something like the world wide web in nature right so if we look at an airplane uh, and if uh, we can explain an airplane to someone who has not seen an airplane right by saying oh it it's like a bird you know it flies and so on but it's very hard to explain the world wide web to someone who doesn't know what it is right and because nothing like the web was ever existed right and um, so uh, researchers also have been grappling 
uh, with what the web is for a long time okay so in the early uh, 90s okay or mid 90s rather right uh, uh, the web was seen as the world's largest database right so uh, it was the world's largest data store and uh, relational database systems at the time was was the biggest uh, in thing uh, oracles and ingress and ibm db2 was coming back you know, so so that that was the major uh, Uh, research um, uh, focus at that time and uh, uh, i remember uh, 1999 when i attended the first world wide web conference there was a big panel discussion uh, which was called uh, is the web a database right so uh, th- that was the question around the time and papers like this started coming you know i mean uh, 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 people started uh, saying how do you query the web you know so there there were uh uh things like webql and so on you know which are uh, uh variants of sql and say okay we should be able to query this web like this right and uh, uh, so research objectives were based on you know how to bring structure to the web you know it's very unstructured and uh, you know chaotic and so on okay now of course we don't look at the web as a database there's a lot of reasons for that and uh, it is clearly not a database so later on uh uh the next uh, major model that came about was maybe the web is a digital library okay not not a database so what is a library a library is somewhat looser than a database you know in a database the schema is very strict uh, you have to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, represent your tables your referential integrity all kinds of stuff you know it's it's very strict but in a digital library it's kind of more looser right and um, so strict notions of query uh, gave way to looser notions of retrieval uh, information retrieval and relevance and so on and strict notions of schema gave way to looser notions of say ontology and so on right and uh, but main thing is the emphasis was still on retrieving information and and the web was still seen as a passive repository you know it it is a, it's a repository of contents and uh, so some of the early uh, web search engines alta vista excite and so on they were actually based like this you know they um, uh they looked at a keyword and looked at the document and computed what is the relevance of the keyword to the document and then uh, pushed it uh, uh, gave these results and so on. okay so so this was the next major model of the web but the first inflection point again in our understanding of, of the web came with uh, google okay uh, the creators of google uh, who shifted the emphasis from uh, from the content of the web to hyperlinks right you see the web basically comprises of two elements right uh, so there is the document and there are the hyperlinks right and uh, so the emphasis shifted from documents to hyperlinks right now if you notice hyperlinks uh, were not created a priori nobody tells people how to create hyperlinks right or where to create hyperlinks right uh, so it is created on an ongoing basis in a completely distributed independent fashion every author of a web page decides you know where to put their hyperlink on their page right and uh, so what the hyperlink does is uh, it kind of um, uh, reveals to us our intentions right what is the intention with which i put this hyperlink you know why did i place this hyperlink here and so on okay and, um, so uh, it was uh, uh, you know uh, uh, th- there was this guy called fanefer bush uh, in the 1940s uh I, somebody told me he was the research advisor of cloud shannon uh, i don't know to what extent it's true but uh, perhaps so so he was the first one to uh, propose this whole concept called hypertext what we now know as hypertext right and uh, so i proposed a machine called memex memory extension so so he was saying how hyperlinks are somewhat like an extension of our memory right and um, so our, uh, human memory is very associative in uh, in nature so uh, if i if i'm talking about say apples here now suddenly i can you know my memory loads in uh, the concept of apples and then works on it and so on right and, uh, so clearly on the web as well we can look at hyperlinks or we can interpret hyperlinks in different ways right uh, so if i have a page right and uh, uh, maybe i'll i'll write this here so if i have a page like this page a and another page b right and there is a hyperlink from page a to page b now you can uh, think of it interpret it in different ways right now so the fact that the author of page a put a hyperlink to page b here means that the author is telling that page b is somehow relevant here right so so it can be seen as a relevance indicator right and uh, similarly if you put a hyperlink 
there's an implicit message for the user to click the hyperlink right so we don't put a door and say don't open it okay this door shall always be locked and so on, right if you put a door it means that i expect you to open it right and uh, so uh, if i put a hyperlink here i expect you to click this and see this page so we can see a hyperlink as an endorsement uh, indicator that i am actually opening your doorway to that thing okay and third uh, is uh, when a user is looking at page a right and clicks on the hyperlink and starts looking at page b right something flows on the hyperlink right you know uh, uh, as a hyperlink as a connector there's something that is flowing right so what is flowing we can see that it's the user's attention that is flowing right so for example uh, in this uh, in this page a let us say there are so many hyperlinks to different pages right and only the hyperlink to page b uh, is clicked more than the others right so that means that uh, a lot of attention has flowed from page a to page b rather than page a to some other pages right so so we can think of every hyperlink as a pathway for the amount of attention that, that is flowing right and uh, so this was one major um, change in the way we understood the web and this came about uh, as um, the well known page rank algorithm by google right and um, so which was based on the hyperlink structure rather than the document structure and uh, and with the hyperlink structure your page rank for example for a page you created is not in your control okay your page rank is determined by what others think of you that is how many others link to you and what is their page rank and so right and um, so this is one major uh, change in which we uh, started looking at the web but really the main the biggest change in our understanding of the web came with web 2.0 right uh, where the web became more and more participatory right so now uh, here we are not just looking at uh, you know how to uh, deliver some documents to users how to rank some documents to users and so on we are looking at how to engage users okay so so now as human beings we are no longer users we are participants right we want users to not just look at a page we want users to post something we want users to click on something we want users to like something or whatever right and uh, so uh, so basically today the web uses us as much as we use the web right and uh, so this is the, this is where we are today in the sense of we are now looking at the web not as a tool so this was how we looked at the web in the 1990s right where you are separate and the web is separate and you fire up the uh, computer you fire up the web browser and then you connect to the web you look for what you want the web will give you and then you go right and uh, so so you are still in control you are still in command right and uh, so this was how we looked at the world wide web uh, earlier but today this is how the web is actually right so you are not uh, in control that is you are not using the web you are just part of the web the web is using you right uh, so and uh, like i said uh, you know you don't even have to be explicitly connected to the web okay your smartphone is connected to the web already right it is already sending a lot of data to google to samsung to apple what wherever right and about you even if it is in airplane mode you know you, uh, i hope uh, I, i guess some of you have seen that video where uh, they uh, uh, actually conduct this experiment uh, so they take the phone out in airplane mode and come back and connect to a wifi but uh, the phone has already tracked so much information about that location even when they were in airplane mode and the moment they connected to wifi it sent all the information to them, right and uh, so so you are connected to the web even without your knowledge right even without your uh, explicit consent uh, to this right and even if you disconnect from the web you as a person that is your footprint your identity okay is still there on the web it's still getting processed right so you could you could have disconnected from every uh, device but your face can still be recognized your voice can still be recognized right and uh, or your friends can uh, 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 you know reveal your location or or whatever right and uh, so for the first time perhaps Uh, in the history of human kind technology research is as much about how to avoid getting exploited by technology rather than how to exploit the technology right so so we are uh, the, for the first time perhaps we are kind of reversing our uh, uh, our uh, uh, emphasis on 
you know how to survive the technology rather than how to exploit the technologies right and uh, and it's, it doesn't even uh, work if you say i'm not on facebook you know i'm i'm just focusing on my work and i don't care what others talk about me and so on right and uh, uh, you know uh, i'll give you a concrete example okay the uh, just a few months ago there was this guy who was selling something in um, in chamrajpet or something and suddenly a mob attacked him okay brutally lynched him to death why because there was a, a rumor going around in facebook uh, on whatsapp saying that uh, there is there is some child kidnapper going around and the mob just decided that this is the child kidnapper and, uh, and he had nothing to do with uh, 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 the mob and, and you see the web working over there now whatsapp is part of the web and, uh, so, and uh, so the thing is uh, uh, the the difference between a tool and a space is that space affects participants on its own proactively okay tool is tool usage is by explicit intentional and conscious choice right while a space just affects us the fact that we are here we are affected by this okay so uh, we are affected by this space whether we like it or not and so on okay so we don't need to even explicitly engage with this with the space right even if we are disengaged even if we consciously disengage it can still affect us okay and uh, you know uh, yeah one little question uh, i would like to question uh, that uh, assertion that it is for the first time that uh, yeah 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 really perhaps for the first, uh, perhaps is the operating word <laughs> because I, i somehow feel that it is this particular thing is a very uh, inherent characteristic of all technology so whenever there is a technological uh, innovation there is always an associated fear that it will result in somebody using it to exploit us or Uh, true true that, uh, that is true that is uh, that is true with all technology in fact uh, that's the next uh, session that i would like to make that uh, every technology in fact creates a space okay the fact that we are saying web is a space is actually nothing new you know there is a for example a subculture created by aviation right if you are inside the aviation bubble you are in a different space you the the kind of the way it affects you would be different right there's a subculture created by trains so if you are inside the train bubble right and uh, uh, but this kind of a space is somehow agnostic that is uh, it's not just about transportation it's not just about uh, medicine it's uh, you know it's kind of covering the entire world right and uh, so new kind of space so uh, so so that's the thing here it it is driven by a small technology but but the kind of social space that it is creating is kind of bringing its own rules it's uh, uh, either to unknown kind of rules and, and so on, right and uh, so uh, so humans as components of uh, of a space where a uh, tool is where we have a dominant relationship with the tool you know right? we kind of uh, uh, use the tool while here we are used by the web right and uh, and uh, yeah i mean there are lots of such um, examples i can uh, i can't think of any uh, immediate examples but there's lots of examples where humans are in fact affected by what is happening in the web uh, even though they are themselves not part of it right and uh, just because everybody else around them are affected they can tend to be adversely affected you know themselves in uh, adversely or uh, you know non adversely okay. so this is one of the models that we have uh, created in um, uh, in our lab so we broadly uh, divide the web into three realms you know so uh, how the web actually functions so at the core is what we call the social realm okay this is where the act- active social interactions happen uh, this is where we have the twitters and the facebooks and uh, youtubes and you know where uh, where uh, kind of opinions are molded where you uh, uh, put uh, opinions kind of um, uh, get returns and so on and uh, outside of the social realm is what we call the trigger realm so this comprises of media companies like say cnn or bbc or republic or whatever right and uh, so typically what they do is uh, uh, the uh, they are publishing agents they are not social uh, websites but what they publish here triggers activity in the social realm right and uh, so cnn publishes an article new york times publishes an article and suddenly there's a controversy or whatever some, some discussions around it and so on, okay and uh, lastly is the inner trail okay which is where we have informational websites so 
uh, say digital universe, Project Gutenberg, and so on. Uh, these typically form the fuel uh, for the discussions that happen here. So uh, the the uh, how the inner realm gets cited in the uh, social realm also tells us a lot about how the you know social cognition around uh, uh, in the social realm is getting molded and so on. okay so uh, if you look at the pattern of footprints that are uh, around this okay so uh, raksha will be talking about our work here in characterizing uh, uh, you know social cognition in the social web and so on. Okay. Yeah, other things have taken center stage. So the World Wide Web kind of started like this, but uh, it, uh, so th there is uh, there's one more thing that uh, was discussed uh, uh, in the last Web Science conference which I went. You know uh, how when the web started, okay, uh, implicitly it was seen as an academic platform. It was like the outside this thing, right? And uh, it was seen as a platform for learning. You know where you go and you learn about new things and so on. Okay. With the dot-com uh, era, it started uh, morphing from an academic platform to a marketplace, right? Uh, where uh, you know uh, you trade and uh, uh, buy and sell things and so on. Okay, but today it is primarily or increasingly seen as a political platform. You know, when uh, when political interests are now seeing the web as uh, you know all political campaigns and debates are slowly shifting to the web, right? And um, so this is a completely different ball game from say a marketplace or a, a learning platform and so on, right? And so uh, this is one more concept um, that um, uh, that has been developed in our uh, in, uh, in our understanding of the web, uh, which is getting more and more relevant. If you so, okay, so this is the idea of a social machine. Okay, so the idea of a social machine is uh, uh, is of an ensemble. Of where uh, you know you have both people and uh, technology working together towards something, right? And uh, so the emergent properties of a social machine are a property of decisions taken by both technology and human beings together, right? And uh, that means humans uh, or people are computational units are, are very much components of the machine. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, things like crowdsourcing, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a social machine at work, right? Uh, so how do you, uh, uh, how do you, for example, recognize an object? Uh, today you, you use deep learning or you know several other machine learning components, and so on. But for a for a lot of a large time, this was done using crowdsourcing, right? Uh, so if you want to generate training data, for example, for your machine learning uh, work, you crowdsource uh, that the training data, right? And so in in your crowdsourcing work, you see that people are Essential elements of your machine, of your bigger machinery, right? And uh, so, both humans and algorithms are integral components. Uh, and uh, uh, the emergent behavior of a social machine is a result of decisions taken by both algorithms and humans. Right? The only thing is, uh, algorithmic behavior is kind of known a priori. Okay, but but humans have this so-called free will. So uh, you know we don't know how humans would would react and how uh, okay. So the main uh, challenge in uh, social machine design okay, is what we call componentizing of humans, right? Uh, so this is a term actually. So how do we componentize humans inside a machinery? You know how um, how do we get humans to do what we want them to do? And uh, okay, uh, the primary approach to componentization is to use incentives. This, this is the age-old wisdom that if you want people to do something, you have to give them incentives, you know, uh, positive or negative incentives. And so, okay, and uh, the, some of the initial work towards incentivizing humans, okay, uh, took um, uh, 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 to, uh, you know, resorted to tangible incentives like monetary incentives, okay, so mechanical turk, crowd flower, and so on, right? And uh, they actually paid humans to work for them, right? And uh, which is very expensive, which uh, difficult to scale, and so on. But more recently, uh, people have discovered some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some other gold mine. Okay, that you can incentivize people to work for you just by psychological incentives. Okay, and it is even more effective than monetary in incentives. It, it doesn't cost you anything, and it can scale uh, very much. Okay, 
and it may adversely affect them but that's not my problem and uh, you know uh, so whatever so psychological incentives you know hey you're great you know you're the best person congratulations your your photo has got five stars and uh, uh, 10000 people are, have viewed your photo and uh, uh, so here is an award for you and so on right and uh, so uh, these kinds of cognitive incentives okay uh, are known to be way more effective than uh tangible incentives right and uh, so uh, and this has been uh, pursued in so many ways for example uh, you know the pichakus and uh, uh, you know the pokemons and others you know which uh, uh, which have been around for a while you know which kind of give you incentives in uh, in different ways right and, uh, and um, uh, there is there is even a term that is coming up now it's called persuasive technology right that is how do you build technology to persuade people to do what you want them to do and there's even the name for it it's called captology so right? and um, so uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, brian fog is one of the uh, well known guys in captology uh, he's a professor at stanford uh, and uh, he consults to major companies around on how do you get user engagement or how do you not just user engagement you know i mean see one thing to note earlier is earlier web companies were interested in how do you get eyeballs that is how do you get user attention to you. now they are no longer interested in just your attention okay they want you to do something okay they, they, they are no longer interested in just your attention they want you to actually click something they want you to actually run somewhere and you know do something you know whatever right and uh, post something and so okay so so this is what i was calling uh, uh, captology that that stanford dot edu you know it's a uh, uh this is uh, you know uh, this is the way the web is moving that is uh, how do you first the web is a space the space is using you the space is componentizing you and that componentization doesn't need monetary incentives it needs only psychological incentives right and it's very cheap psychological incentives is very cheap to uh, uh, you know uh, provide and uh, there's a lot of research going uh, into how do you uh, provide the psychological incentives right and uh, to Uh, and um, of course um, on the captology uh, website they say yes this can be a scary topic okay machines designed to influence humans and then they go on to say that uh, uh, we believe that new advances in technology can help uh, promote world peace in 30 years you know and, uh, so uh, my uh, comment for that is famous last words and uh, so uh, i mean we are not not just looking at one here and now the, the moment we say we are doing large scale psychology for world peace i think uh, i don't know about you but for me i start panicking you know so uh, 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 you know what kind of world peace that that we are going to get and, uh, so captology basically uh, the definition of captology is uh, using computers to change what we think and do right including what we think you know how uh, so in fact uh, uh, a large part of my course called the web and the mind uh, talks about this you know i mean uh, at least let us know you know how we are uh, how we are getting used and uh, maybe that that's the first line of defense you know uh, to kind of um, uh, go beyond this okay so what are some of the tools of persuasion the primary tool of persuasion is attention right i can manipulate your attention in in different ways and uh, attention has very specific properties right and uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of research that has gone into how uh, uh, how attention works and um, for example uh, attention is one exclusive that is if you are paying attention to me you are not paying attention to something else right and so so there's a exclusivity uh, problem okay but then it's also autobiographical that is if you are paying attention to me but somebody in the uh, back row mentions your name right suddenly your attention shifts there right so so even if i'm paying attention on one channel if on another channel uh, something relevant to me is uttered suddenly my attention shifts there right and uh, so so there's a very specific uh, property in which attention works it's it's all directed towards me right and um, and uh, the third uh, property of attention is uh, transitivity right so um, for example uh, are you all paying attention to me okay now let's talk about watermelons so can you imagine in your mind you thought about watermelon for for a small amount of time right and uh, did you ever imagine that you'll think about watermelons when you came here 
right so so because you are paying attention to me i can shift your attention to watermelon right now i can shift your attention to whatever i want maybe panda bears tigers right um, or uh, gujarat riots or you know now you see where it's getting right or uh, you know uh, rafale deal or this thing you know uh, some some this, uh, now uh, the, the moment you are paying attention to me i can shift attention to different uh, uh, wherever i want right and uh, so so that that's how you kind of uh, so uh, uh, and you see that there, there's another thing you know we don't say you are having attention to me right you say that you are paying attention to me so what do we mean by pay why do we use the term pay what are you paying me what is it that you are so to pay means you are giving something of value to others right what is it of value that you are giving me your your mind your brain right and uh, so and and your time of course right uh, that is i don't want to think about rafael a deal okay but i'll make you think about it okay i'll make you think about uh, maybe you uh, if you're not paying attention to me you would have thought about uh, where will i get my next salary from or where will i get uh, how will i fix my plumbing problem you know something that's relevant to you but instead of thinking something relevant to you you are now thinking something that's relevant to me right and, uh, and so 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 th- that that's how transitivity works that uh, the, the moment if i capture your attention i can tell you what to think about right and uh, and uh, the most insidious form of attention is the last one again so if you are are you all paying attention to me okay now uh, please do not think about grapes right now what did you think about so so that's the thing you know uh, the, the thing with attention is no negation so uh, even if you say this is bad okay that is where the attention will go this is evil that is where the attention will go right and uh, and uh, in fact uh, our definition of evil is something that that grows stronger uh adversely uh, just by attention you know what evil uh, uh, feeds on it does not feed on your actions it feeds on your attention the more mind share it gets the more uh, you know uh, i'll i'll give you a concrete example okay uh, do you think uh, uh, you know uh, what do you think is the weapon of a terrorist okay do you think the terrorist who came to mumbai on 26 11 some 11 14 of them were there right uh, do you think they thought that uh, they are going to take over india and then start ruling over it not really right i mean all of them kind of knew that they are going to die over there right and uh, but why did they still go ahead with it what what was why did the handlers whatever okay still go ahead with it what is the thing that they are uh, uh, you know so the the real objective of te- uh, terror attack okay is not the attack itself but the you know distrust and the you know paranoia and and the thing that it generates later on right and uh, so the the amount of attention that we start giving to paranoia okay to distrust the amount of mind share that that it occupies suddenly each and every place is full of security each of uh, you know there's there's so much of distrust between us and the other and so on right and uh, so the more attention that uh, we can you know think of certain memes saying people who look like us cannot be trusted okay that that's the meme and you just push it across by means of a terror attack by means of whatever right and uh, and that is the real uh, uh, you know objective right and and you can do that today even without actually making a terror attack okay you can do that on social media directly right and uh, so so things like this you know there, there are lots of ways by which uh, cognitive persuasion can happen you know very very uh, easily very very uh, simply and so right there are also other things are called priming uh, i'll i'll show you uh, in the next slide uh, i'll show you how uh, i can manipulate your thinking and uh, you know and show that uh, uh, make it appear to you that as though you thought about it yourself right and uh, so this was an experiment done uh, in uh, in a us uh, school setting uh, school or college setting and uh, uh, there were there were two sets of students right uh, for which the following questions were asked in a particular order okay so the first question uh, that was asked is uh, should us journalists reporting from foreign lands uh, be answerable to local laws or the us laws and press freedom so so the question basically says our people are going somewhere and reporting from there 
Now, uh, should they be answerable to our loss on press freedom or their loss on press freedom? Right? And uh, what do you think most people answered? Yeah, they, uh, you know, uh, they said no, no, no. They are U.S. citizens. They are answerable to our loss, right? And uh, and uh, uh, there was nothing which is said about foreign lands, right? Uh, in fact, uh, some of them were asked, which foreign country did you think of when, you know, when uh, when you saw a foreign land? And many of them said uh, Saudi Arabia or something like that, right? And, but it could well be Canada or or uh, Australia or something. Right? And, uh, so, but uh, but anyway, the, the idea was that this one primed uh, the next uh, answer, you know, primed the response for the next stars. Uh, okay? So the next question said, uh, should foreign journalists reporting from our soil should they be answerable to their loss or our loss? Right? And uh, so, what do you think uh, most of them answered? Yeah, so they said, okay, you know, uh, because uh, you know they are their citizens, let them uh, take care of their losses, right? And, uh, now, for the second set of uh, people, the same questions were asked in the reverse order, right? Uh, so the uh, first one were asked, uh, uh, should foreign journalists reporting from U.S. should they be answerable to our loss or their loss? Right? And again, the way this is asked, they said, no, no, they should obey the law of the land. You know, they should uh, they should obey our law and so on. Okay. And uh, and then this question uh, asked them when our journalists are reporting from their land, uh, a lot of people would like to say, okay, they can, uh, uh, you know, uh, take their losses. Okay. So if you see here, uh, you know, I'm leading you to a particular conclusion. So so this is what in uh, in legal terminology this is called legal uh, leading questions, right? So you you prime uh, you you induce some kind of a priming to think in a particular way uh, using the first. Uh, experience, and then add a series of questions that extend the same line of thinking, right? And then you can you can do that in in any other uh, sense, right? And uh, so this is what is called as the availability heuristic, right? And uh, so availability heuristic is used very often uh, for for manipulating opinions and, and so on, right? And uh, so these these are all elements of captology, you know how. Uh, uh, Google works, or not just Google, Facebook, or any kind of, uh, uh, it works to kind of, uh, and we end up thinking that we are the ones making the choice, but actually the choice is made for us through uh, priming heuristic and so on, okay? There are also some things called conformity experiments, uh, I won't go into that, and it, uh, but lots of work around social pressure, and, uh, yes, yeah. Uh -huh. Being a user to a part of the system. Right. So the more you talk about it, it's like the individual is becoming increasingly more passive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So are we going back to the cycle of becoming a user? Oh, well, uh, uh, by user, I mean a user is someone who has complete independence. You know, by user, when you're using your car. So you're user to a part of the system. Hmm. No, no, no. In fact, I, I'm using that term for the user. So I'm using the term uh, by participant. I'm using more. Uh, okay, it's it's a question of terminology, I guess. So so by participant, I mean you're more passive. Uh, but by user, you're more active. So you're a user of your car. Your car does not tell you what to do or where to go. That right? you decide where to go or you know what to do. But the web tells you what to do many times. The the web tells you you know uh, which link to click and. Uh, Right, right. right. So, this is I, I think I was the part, so yeah, yeah. I, I see your, uh, uh, I, I see the confusion there. In fact, uh, the term participatory, when it comes to say policy making and so on, okay, there's a very positive connotation. That means it is inclusive. It is you are asking people for opinions. That's how Web 2.0 also started, right? Uh, as uh, yeah, you're you're asking for people's opinions and so on. Okay, but slowly the way it is shifting is. Uh, I don't really care about your opinion. I care your opinion only on this topic, which is relevant to me, right? And uh, so, uh, or, or my interest and, and so on, right? And uh, so, so you're becoming more of a component. Maybe the, that, that's the third term, from user to participant to component, 
right? And uh, so the componentization is, is what is more alarming today, right? The, the, that's, that's the way it is. Um, in fact, uh, one of the slogans of Tim Berners-Lee today is what he calls the re-decentralization of the web, right? Uh, so, uh, and how do you kind of give back control of the web to its to the people rather than to a very few interests which are kind of uh, pushing through these things, right? And uh, yeah, so uh, so this is uh, uh, what we, uh, you know, uh, some of you may know from the 1990s, there was a cartoon in the New, uh, in the New Yorker, right? Uh, which, uh, which said something like this, in, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog and so on, okay? So we have some addendums to that. Uh, the same dog comes back in the 2000s and say, how does Google know I'm a dog? And uh, uh, in the 2010s, it's, uh, it comes back and say, how does Facebook know the dog is my friend and so on, okay? And today, if you see, especially in places like China and so on, there's a big system of social credit that's going around. I don't know if you've heard of that, okay? Everything that you do earns or, you know, deletes points from you, right? And uh, So you need not even be on the web. If your face is recognized on, a, on the camera somewhere in a public place and you're doing something which somebody thinks is not a good uh, thing to do, then your points could be cut and so on, okay? So the dog is saying, all I did was bark at the postman and now I'm not allowed in trains. Uh, so uh, uh, how the, uh, uh, you know, the web is changing from, you know, the anonymity, the freedom that was there to, to actually that, that's coming back to, right? And uh, so, so this is the post-web world. I, I'm sorry, I've taken a lot of time, so you guys have to, go much faster. Uh, so uh, there are, of course, macro effects of the world, uh, of the web, the free speech debates and so on. And there are micro effects as well uh, on, on individuals, you know, persuasion, addiction, online disinhibition and so on, right? And um, all of these are relevant to us. In fact, uh, the web and the mind course, we are looking at this part, the micro effects uh, of, uh, of the web. So yeah, this is where I'd like to stop. Yeah, maybe I... Uh, this one thing, uh, this is another interesting theory that's coming out from Oxford. Uh, this theory called social intelligence, uh, sorry, super intelligence, right? Uh, the idea of super intelligence is that uh, the web is creating, making components of all of us, right? And, uh, and we're all working towards uh, you know, something or the other, and we're all becoming part of an emergent global super intelligence that we are not even aware of. So, so the entire connected world is becoming one organism and uh, it, it is super intelligent and we don't even know its existence. You know, the, the, that, that's the idea of super intelligence that's, uh, you know, the, uh, so there's even an uh, institute called Future of Humanity Institute, you know, which looks into that. Um. So this is uh, how our attitudes towards the web has been changing. In the 1990s, we used to be very gung-ho about the web. The web is an opportunity and so on. Uh, 2000s, uh, after lots of things happened, we started getting scared of the web. But now we are kind of passively accepting, saying, okay, the web is, now don't speak loudly, just, uh, just stay there and you know, observe what is happening and, and then you know, uh, don't get used and, and so on. So this, this is where, uh, so this is our lab uh, and you're welcome to uh, you know, uh, speak more. One question asked, which is machine? So, so you said it's a symbol of human and it's so obvious what is the boundary the web the social machine or is it one user using amazon so yeah uh, yeah what is the boundary right uh, so typically there is some kind of a semantic boundary like say facebook uh, is a social machine so th there's one uh, application which is uh, so facebook actually is not one application uh, by facebook we mean the facebook application and its ecosystem uh, of all apps that connect to Facebook and so on. Similarly, Twitter and all apps that are on Twitter. So, uh, so we are uh, uh, today uh, we are not looking at the web in terms of uh, pages and hyperlinks. We are in fact looking at the web in terms of social machines and their interactions between them. So, so social machines are somewhat like the galaxies that you know, in the. So that, that, that's what the web observatory work is. So, so we observe social machines. We try to uh, characterize what th their dynamics and so on. So that's. Uh, um, okay, good afternoon. I will uh, very quickly go through the slides. So I, my name is Raksha and I'm a PhD student in Web Science Lab. And uh, I am working on uh, designing what we call the Cogno, which is a web observatory. So before going to uh, describing Cogno, I will first talk about what is a web, obs web observatory. 
So, uh, Web Observatory is an initiative uh, by Web Science Trust uh, or uh, initiative by the University of Southampton, where um, the aim of the whole Web Observatory project is to observe the web and observe various parts of the web and uh, share, gather and share data sets and applications that are built on the web. Just like the analogy is very similar to the physical observatories which uh, observe the sky and share data among them. Web observatories observe the web and there are, um, today there are around 15 web observatories across the world and a lot of them have various different focus on the, uh, in, even inside the web, a lot of the web observatory focus on some parts of the web. And uh, so the web observatory that we are building at IIIT, IIITB is, uh, is focused on understanding the impact of social media on social cognition of the society. So we are specifically interested in uh, the cognition and social cognition aspect of the social media. And uh, um, so, and as a part of the web observatory, we are uh, proposing that uh, social media is acting as a marketplace of opinion where uh, there are a lot of uh, participants who with differed interest who interact with each other, exchange opinions and uh, a discourse around any topic is getting you know, shaped on this marketplace of opinion or social media. Uh, now, the discourses are uh, discourses also go on uh, even in the offline world. But the only difference is with social media is the scale and and that we can record or we have a record of all these discussion and we can analyze them. And uh, and before uh, going further, I will I will first define what we mean by an opinion. An opinion uh, from any user uh, is a combination of an abstraction and an expression where an abstraction is the person's perspective about the object of inquiry and expression is his emotion. As you can see, if, uh, if the user is saying uh, this country is totally intolerant, his, the object of inquiry is if the country is liberal or intolerant and he is, his perspective is that it is intolerant and he is negative or angry about it, which is the expression. So given that an opinion is a combination of uh, an abstraction and an expression. Yeah, what do you mean if somebody could also say, you know, it is totally intolerant and it's angry about it. Yeah. So that, that, that's a difference. Correct. So a co as a combination of both abstraction and an expression is, uh, becomes the opinion of that user. And uh, how does this combination of an abstraction and uh, expression diffuse through the social uh, media and create, uh, you know, create discourses around the social media. And uh, by the end of you know, June 2018, there were a lot of people who are month actively uh, participating on various social media websites. And uh, uh, research center, uh, Pew Research Center ha has uh, has reported that around 68% of Americans pop population occasionally get their news from social media. People are getting information about the current affairs that is going on through social media. And uh, this, you know, this contributes to the discourse around the topic and their worldviews and their beliefs. And uh, we want to see for a given uh, topic, what is the discourse around it? And the discourse is made up of several different narratives. And each of this uh, narrative is a set of compatible opinions. When I say compatible opinions, they're all the set of opinions which have common uh, abstraction and expression. Uh, so, so if I say, I will go through examples further. So what we specifically look at is given a trending topic on social media, can we characterize the signature of uh, that uh, trending topic and say what is, what is the discourse about this topic and what are all the different narratives that this topic is driven into. Right? So for example, so let's say we take demonetization on social media, uh, which was trending in 2016 uh, towards the end. So there were a lot of, uh, there are a lot of tweets that are going on supporting Modi and saying there were around 86% uh, people of India supporting Modi and there are a lot of people supporting demonetization. And there were also reports of how demonetization is uh, you know, leading to several deaths and uh, you know, there were also positive remarks about demonetization and they were questioning demonetization if Paytm was already informed about demonetization and there were a lot of memes and there were a lot of 
um, sarcastic comments on demonetization going on. So a uh, lot of things were going on. So given uh, all these uh, tweets and there are different from various different people, can we uh, say this whole uh, topic of demonetization is being pulled into these particular directions and each of this direction is about these things. So these are actually the results from the model and uh, the model has you know, ca um, identified eight different narratives for demonetization. And um, here you can see one of the narratives is about huge support for demonetization and uh, one of the narratives is about terrorist attack on a lot of banks and looting banks and uh, one more is about fund shortage and a um, lot of people killing themselves and one more is about Paytm being informed. So, so this gives kinds of, kind of an overview of the topic uh, saying what are all the different narratives in the topic and what is the discourse around the topic that is going on in social media and uh, so so this is how uh, this is the model how we uh, get these narratives so given we've given a topic on social media we take all possible you know tweets uh, currently we stick to twitter as our social media platform and we take all the tweets and uh, do a little bit of pre-processing uh, cl cleaning the tweets and then generate word embeddings for all the posts. So word embeddings are, uh, you know, a vector representation for each uh, words, each word in the corpus, which captures the context of the word. And uh, since our um, op uh, opinion or post or tweet is made up of both abstraction and expression, we also add sentiment as a part of the word embedding of each post. And all these word embeddings are clustered. So each of this cluster that is obtained is considered as a narrative and each of this narrative is then uh, analyzed to extract key phrases from the narrative and the key sentiments of the phrases. So that's how we have a result uh, like this for each narrative key phrases that are identified. Um, and also we, uh, uh, we did this experiment on two other uh, data sets which were uh, inauguration of uh, Trump's presidential speech and then women's march and uh, there was an interesting uh, participation participatory nature of user where on the x axis you see number of uh, narratives uh, that users are participating and y axis you see number of uh, number of users that are participating in those narratives so you can see that almost 80% of the users are not participating in any of the narratives and uh, here you can see users with, a, with at least one participation and you can see 90% of the users participate only in single one narrative. Uh, users who participate in two different narratives are very small. And uh, here, so with this we argue that the narratives that we have got are more a representation of what users are thinking or the user distribution uh, beneath um, the tweets, not just the content of the tweets. And uh, so if for demonetization itself, uh, we also saw for each narratives that were obtained, who are the users who are uh, who have the most um, impact in that narrative. And uh, we actually tracked them, uh, not track, we actually identified uh, the Twitter accounts of those users. Uh, so for this narrative, uh, which was about uh, Paytm being informed, and the critical question on demonetization, um, Surjawala, who was who is a Congress MLA, was the user with most impact in that narrative. And uh, in this narrative, uh, why why don't Modi address Parliament about this issue? Shashi Tharoor was the main person. And uh, and interestingly, in this one where uh, uh, where there were a lot of memes saying 86% of people are supporting demonetization. It was from an account called Modi Barasa, which was not ident uh, verified. It was not a verified account, but there were a lot of retweets done um, on these tweets. And uh, and this terrorist attack was from Gaurav Savant. And yeah, this one was from uh, Kumar Vishwas, which, they, which was a um, you know, sarcasm on demonetization. And this itself become a completely different uh, narrative. And... Uh, and uh, so this is what we have done till now and what we plan to do is analyze the narratives uh, across time 
to see how these narratives evolve over time and given a topic can we say okay now uh, these narratives are competing with each other or these narratives are uh, giving uh, way to a new narrative like this and we want to see what are the dominant narratives across the timeline of uh, of a particular topic so so that's what we plan and these are some of the references so um, i can chaitali can continue good afternoon everybody i'll just uh, quickly introduce my work uh, so i'm talk working on automatic generation of coherent and engaging learning pathways for open corpus educational resources uh, so the number of open learning resources is increasing on web every year and uh, the open educational resources are created independently by different people so um, open educational resources are of different media types activities exposition styles and teaching methodologies a user interested in learning uh, may face uh, some of these problems like disorientation where the student would move forward and backward to find which resource to uh, read first uh, then there could be a, a cognitive overload because there is an abundance of information and this could result in anxiety for a learner uh, then the this could decrease the efficiency of education so um, it is important that for a learner a learning pathway is well structured to understand and since we are dealing with op open corpus domain it, this problem is a complex problem so uh, we think about uh, learning pathway as analogous to a uh, google maps so source is what the student knows currently destination is what the student wants to learn and the route is the path taken uh, by the student to uh, uh, reach uh, the knowledge he wants to acquire so the narrative arc problem that i am looking at is to find the content associated with each of these points on the route so there is no analogy for this in google map um so to understand this uh, let us consider this competency matrix each of the learning resources are uh, embedded into this two dimensional logical space so on the x axis there is domain and y axis there is a pedagogical depth uh, so and each uh, point on this uh, 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 like this point here or any of these points that will represent something called as competency so uh, here we can see that uh, a student wants to go from position current position to learning goal and the route is created for the competency the narrative arc problem is to find uh different learning resources among these learning resources such that the pathway that is generated is semantically coherent and engaging to the user so the uh, in this um, example we can see that the green pathway is a narrative arc we have chosen some of the learning resources which could be coherent and we don't claim that there is only one learning pathway or one narrative arc there could be many of them so here i have just shown another uh, learning pathway uh, so it could be a different granularity level so uh, in this previous example it was we were uh, looking at the maths uh, oh i don't know yeah here we are looking at the maths domain so here you can see uh, the domains are counting and cardinality and here we can see that it's there for um, kindergarten the next domain is uh, spread across from kindergarten to fifth grade so if we, if you want to look particular Yeah. this could also be applied to uh, domains like higher education where we don't have a specific learning progression given or any kind of niche field also so uh, we are op we are not saying it's uh, fixed only to grade uh, up to 12th or anything so that's why that pattern is chosen uh, so we look at narrative uh, um, 
comprising of two important elements one is topical coherence and exposition coherence the topical coherence is already covered by the route that we saw uh, marked in brown and exposition uh, coherence we mean that the way a one concept is presented in a learning resource and resonant with the way next concept is presented in the next learning resource so that is what we call as uh, exposition coherence um we also uh, look at some uh, something called as cognitive engagement for narrative work so cognitive engagement pertains to the cognitive effect of the learn uh, learning resource on the user so cognitive engagement uh, can be thought of uh, uh, as two parts one is voluntary attention and involuntary attention so voluntary attention is basically personalization so it could be like intrinsic motivation or learning styles etc for example um, some student uh, may find it very interesting if you give a very difficult problem to them and uh, that will make them interested in learning but there could be some other student to whom you you can just uh, give simple tasks and uh, simple um, work workflow so that they can learn so it depends on the student's learning style and in involuntary attention it is uh, appropriate deployment of surprise and suspense so if i have a learning path which is mostly just text and video then it could put the uh, student to uh, sleep so if suppose i give some uh, interesting question which will make the student think or if you give um, a game kind of uh, scenario where some students can uh, take part as an activity then it could make the learning pathway more uh, um, more interesting to the learner so my problem is to first create the semantic pathway of this learning and then see how uh, cognitively engaging it is for the learner and all this we are doing on open corpus resources that are available on the web so i guess we don't have time so that's uh, uh so uh, for, i have worked on one part of it called computing exposition coherence so we uh, look at the um, pairs of learning resource and we try to identify how coherent the resources are so um, position, see every learning resource has one main topic and many sub topics are used to different extents to uh, explain the main topic so the exposition coherence uh, means the transition of topical distribution from one learning resource to the next is minimal but not zero um so it is built upon ideas of discourse theory and cognitive load theory which states that coherent or connectedness of ideas leads to better understanding and well structured learning pathway increases learning capacity of the user or the learner uh, 